Thank you everybody for being here. We're really excited to have, be showing this talk tonight. My name is Erica Felicella. I am the executive producer with Aurora here in Dallas. I uh, just want to give a giant thanks to our sponsor, PNC Foundation, that made uh, this talk and our grant, our last grant cycle, um, a reality. So um, I'm going to read a little bit about this, this man here on the screen, Christopher Blay, and also Annette Lawrence, who is not uh, on the video with us tonight, but she is who Christopher is discussing um, about their lives, art, and everything else in the talk that you guys are about to see. Uh, Christopher Blay is a Houston-based artist, a writer uh, with a BFA from Texas Christian University. He's currently the news editor uh, at Glass Tire Magazine and was previously the curator of the Art Corridor Galleries at Tarrant County College Southeast. Blay makes work about being Black in America and uses science fiction, humor, and current events to navigate the experience. Most of his work has been in installations and conceptual work using elements of photography, painting, video, and sculpture. The former Carter Community Artist and Moss Chumley Award recipient has also re received a Nasher Sculpture Center micro grant, as well as the Otis and Velma Davis Dossier travel grant from the Dallas Museum of Art. His public works include the ongoing East Rosedale Monument Project and Dindy for Annabelle in Dallas Coons Creek Park near Oak Cliff. Glad to have you here, Christopher. Now I'm gonna read a little bit about Annette uh, so you guys know her uh, a little better. Uh, Annette Lawrence's art transforms raw data into drawings, objects, and installations. The data accounts for and measures everyday life. Her subjects of inquiry range from body cycles to ancestor portraits, music lesson, lessons, unsolicited mail, and journal keeping. She addresses questions of text as image and the relationship between text and code. Her work is grounded in examining what counts, how it is counted, and who is counting. Her process is one of making and unmaking, looking and waiting. She recognizes things that go unannounced, remain steady and continuous, are remarkable on the surface and develop meaning over time. Her work has been widely exhibited and is held in museums and private collections, including the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Dallas Museum of Art, Rachofsky Collection, Art Pace in San Antonio, the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, American Airlines, and the Art Collection of the Dallas Cowboys. She received the 2018 McDowell Fellowship, the 2015 Moss Chumley Award from the Meadows Museum, and the 2009 Otis and Velma Davis Dossier Travel Grant from the Dallas Museum of Art. Her work was included in the 1997 Biennial at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. She received a BFA from the Hartford Art School and an MFA from the Maryland Institute uh, College of Art. Lawrence recently retired from her post as a professor of studio art at the University of North Texas. She will begin a visiting faculty position at Bennington College in Bennington, Vermont in August, 2021. Again, uh, so grateful for these two artists. I just wanna uh, give Christopher a chance to say hello. Uh, before I give a few more little statements before we go into the talk. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure to be here. And Annette sends her regrets. She is in the process of moving or she would have been here with us today. Um, thank you for having me, Aurora and Erica. Uh, it is always a pleasure to talk about artist works and art that's happening in DFW. So I'm happy to be here. Great. Um, I just want to let everybody know that there's the little Q&A uh, button on your screen during the talk. Please feel free to ask questions. Um, we will be having a Q&A question period, answer, answer period after the video. Uh, so you can ask before or you can ask after. So I hope everybody enjoys the talk. 
and we will see you again on the other side. We're going to turn our video off and our, and our uh, microphones off and we'll talk to you soon. Hello, and thank you, Aurora Dallas, for inviting us to have a conversation around the topic of our work and how it connects to our community and the importance of growing artist communities, the importance of equality and diversity in the arts. And just we're just going to have a conversation about our work because I think once we start talking about what we do and our connection, I think those themes are um, interwoven into both our practice, the sort of uh, social responsibility that we feel as artists to the community that we make work in. And um, we'll just, that's, that's what we're talking about. So here we are. Okay. <laughs> So before I even start this conversation, I have to uh, say that this is a bittersweet conversation because Annette is packing up her studio that we're in right now to move. Annette, where are you moving to? I'm moving to uh, Bennington, Vermont to teach at Bennington College for two years. And I'm moving my base to Decatur, Georgia, which is near my sister's place in Stone Mountains, outside of Atlanta. What prompts the decision to move? To move. I mean, uh, that's a great opportunity. It sounds yeah. like a great opportunity. The Bennington job was just something, uh, you know, I was invited to apply for, and it was very attractive because it's just teaching. That's it. It's, I'll be a visitor. I'll work with students directly. I won't have any other responsibilities, and I'll be in beautiful Bennington, Vermont. <laughs> so, there's so many things about that that are attractive. Um, and the move to Decatur is just being closer to family. Yeah. Time when I need to do that. Um, I'm no longer teaching at UNT, so I didn't have any reason to be in Denton, although I was really looking forward to just having a low key, low overhead life here. I kind of created this whole thing for myself. And then, yeah. you know, life happens. And how long have changed. you, how long have you been in Denton? 24 years. Well, 25 almost. Wow. Uh, in the summer, it'll be 25. When did you move here, and where did you move from? I moved to Denton from Houston. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was, um, it was 1996. I moved to Houston from Austin. Mm. I only lived there for about four months. And I moved to Austin from Baltimore, where I went to grad school, in 1990. Wow. So I've been in Texas for 30 years. And uh, so that's a long time, and I feel really like this is my home, and it will always be my home. Yeah. No, I, I totally get that. And I think part of moving, uh, part of what might be bittersweet for for you, but definitely for me, is this idea of being in a place for a significant amount of time and creating that connection with the community there, especially as artists, and then getting a great opportunity to expand your community in another place uh, you're about to go through that I just went through that a year and a half ago mm -hmm. moving from the DFW area to uh, Houston moving from a, a community like Houston which was sort of maybe your most recent move before you moved to Denton mm -hmm. um, what was that uh, connection what was the Houston art scene like like, were you connected to people? Were you, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, so I was there from the, like maybe early 91 till 96. And um, I worked at the Community Artist Collective with Michelle Bond, which was like. Great yeah, place. Yes, yeah, ground zero for black artists in the city of Houston. Um, and I was an artist in residence there through the Texas Commission on the Arts. Um, so I felt like I was right in the middle of something really vital and um, welcoming and 
also just expanding exponentially at every moment, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, every black artist in Texas is connected to Michelle. <laughs> There's just not one single one that hasn't been, been, been uh, helped by her or encouraged by her. Uh, so that landing there was really, yeah. in, in, in just the very beginning of my career, was perfect. I'm learning that about Michelle. And when I first moved, I think it was just before I moved, uh, Vicky Meek had a show there. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a thousand shows in like oh, yeah. 30 days. That, year was, that was a year, <laughs> that was a year Vicky, for sure. <laughs> uh, but one of her shows was at the Community Artists Collective, and that's uh, where I met Michelle Barnes. And it's such a great space. It When I walked in, I, I immediately felt that sense of the title of the space, the community part of it. Knowing that it's been there for a minute, and seeing a lot of um, like Houston presence in that space. And for one person, I'm sure she would say she hasn't done it all alone, but, uh, she say that. <laughs> <laughs> but for She's, someone to continue in that space for yeah. so long. She, you know, the collective started, I think in 87 and I got there in 90, so it was very early. Yeah. And um, it was in a building on Elgin and the branch initially. Mm. And that was, um, you know, I, I remember hearing someone say that there was more energy per square inch in that building than probably anywhere in the city of Houston. Wow. And there was programming with children. There was a dark room there. There was a ceramics space. There mm -hmm. was a gallery space. Um, and the exhibitions, well, the gallery and exhibition space is the same thing. But yeah. Uh, anyways, that, you know, so I met Tierney Malone and David McGee. Mm. And, Selvin, Selvin Jarman, and uh, Marsha Dorsey Outlaw. Jean Lacey came through, Vicky Meek came through. Yeah. Alvy Wardlaw was pretty involved with the collective. Lizette Jackson was sort of the, the editor of the newsletter called Ashe. Yeah. Um, Man, what a time to be in Houston. Yeah. <laughs> I think I saw a photograph that, uh, I want to say Rick Lowe posted it. Uh, but it was from the early 90s and it was just this like yeah. one of those quintessential photographs of all these black artists right right because when, when you mention Rick then there's both Burt's Burt Long Burt Samples yeah Floyd Newsom Jesse Lott yeah George Smith Kaneem Smith John Biggers was alive yeah in that time you know so and there was artists, so for me, I was in like I was in my early twenties, late twenties, mm -hmm. and uh, there were artists who were like the elders, and there were also teenage artists. Yeah, like well, Kaneem was a teenager back then, <laughs> and um, Ricardo Francis. Um, they were at the high school for visual performing arts back in those days. Yeah. Um, so it was it was great to be a part of this multi generational community of artists in in the city of Houston, and I think because because Houston was not quite on the radar, you know, mm -hmm. it was easier to meet everyone, and it, it was it was easy also to connect with the um, you know the museum community, the collectors, the gallery owners. You yeah, know, those it was not that everything felt very uh, fluid. And then you zipped out of Houston and landed in Denton. Well, yeah, job. <laughs> yeah. It was. I love living in Houston, and I was. It was. You know, I felt like you know, I had a very affluent experience yeah. with very little money, and um, then I needed like something regular. And so, yeah. So I came to Denton, and I always. I, I believe that if I hadn't been in Houston those years and hadn't sort of planted my professional roots there, and. Um, you know, established myself to a certain extent that I wouldn't have been able to be in Denton. Like yeah. It, that being there made it possible for me to be in Denton. Yeah. And um, and then just the momentum from from the experience there just carried me for you know a very long time here. Yeah. And you know also like once I got to Denton, in terms of black guards, there wasn't as much to offer. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt really. It was important to connect with Dallas yeah. and Fort Worth, but 
um, the, the South Dallas Cultural Center was became my kind of the base, the touchstone place for me to have black culture in my life. Yeah, I, I had to drive an hour for it, but was it Vicky running it at the time? Sure. Yeah. 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 I uh, had met Vicky. I think it was like maybe the early two thousands. By then, she had been there for uh, a few years, and. But I went there for a, a theater production, mm-hmm. and I think Tammy Gomez was a part of that theater production. She's a DFW artist. Um, but I think that was also, and then I, I would later get to know Mickey, uh, Vicky very well because uh, she is woven into the fabric of the DFW artists that that are worth checking out whenever they do something <laughs> and then she gave me an exhibition at the South Dallas Cultural Center and then that's where I met Harold and then just sort of like got to know the the community a little more I got to know the neighborhood but uh, going back to your early days in Denton I'm trying to remember um, I was at TCU and uh, I think it was Anjali Wilkerson was teaching a photography class that I was in and she told me about your show at the Gallery 414 oh, yeah. and that was my introduction to your work. Oh wow. Um, and then I don't know when we like officially <laughs> met but I do know that uh, it was around that time. Uh, that because I had always already started going to the the tu- the Tuesday evening lectures at the Modern, exactly. back in the old building when they had wine and <laughs> <laughs> you could hang out. Uh, but yeah, and then we started hanging out because it was uh, me and you and Vincent would yep. uh, Vincent Valsetta, um would end up going to the sandwich shop. going to the sandwich shop the yeah. great outdoors sandwich shop uh, across the street and exactly. have a conversation after the lectures and that was such a great uh, just sort of informal um, sit down with artists and I, I got to know a little more about your work and Vincent's work and just expand my experience with with art in North Texas and I think it's part of um, what grows that community, the idea that um, we can all sort of assemble in these pockets of places, but then expand into the greater community. And um, Yeah, There's, it's necessary to be just at times with black artists in order to be able to be with everybody else. Yeah. I think having that, um, I mean, there's a certain kind of conversation we can have that where we don't have to fill in <laughs> some details that they're just there. Yeah. Um, and Or explain the, or justify or, yeah, I know what you're saying. Right. It's really, really important. And then and then we can be our whole self, every you know, outside of that, that space of yeah. with each other. Um, and I do. I remember those. Those. I mean, the, the Tuesday evening um, series is one of the best things. Period. In this area, and that that's where I would always see you. Yeah. I don't know that I ever really saw you anywhere else. No. For years. <laughs> you know, maybe you know, fifteen years. I only ever saw you there. I mean, thank you, Terry Thornton, and the Modern. Yes. I mean, that was really a big part of my art education. Um, right. As, yeah, even when I was at uh, TCU, we would go and have um, one of our courses with Mark Thistlethwaite was uh, to attend the lectures and then like write a page about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but so many great like icons of contemporary art <laughs> would just be like four rows down from us. <laughs> Having these great conversations about their work. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was a great, amazing. great thing. Um, 
and and in the beginning when I first moved to Denton, it was literally thirty minutes from my house to the auditorium, sitting down. Thirty minutes. Not anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> Denton has grown. Fort Worth has grown. Traffic has grown. I thirty five has been under construction for ever. It's too much. It still seems like it's still under construction. <laughs> the in my freshman year in art school at the Hartford Art School, Hartford, Connecticut, was uh, the the most the steepest learning curve of my life up until that point, and I was I was the seventeen year old kid who was like, "That's not art." You know, like I had all my opinions, <laughs> and then it, it, I just got worn down really quick. Like within a few months, I was sort of you know drinking the Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they get you. Yeah, but it was it was pretty interesting to just. Um, be immersed in art since 1945. Yeah. From the beginning, like walking in the door, and we had that to, to contend with. Yeah. Man, what an experience. It. And I, I think that's a testament to an art education um, because I think you can be an artist and become an artist without going through any sort of academic experience True. but I think that academic experience unless you're sort of an individual learner and you can sort of gravitate towards that stuff yourself um, it really um, expands the idea of what art can be and what creativity can be and how that can really impact and affect the world around us. I mean, we're looking at serious police reform as a possibility as a result of artists being a part of the struggle to make things happen and to make things right. And those conversations don't happen without people speaking out. And as artists, I think we have this um, opportunity to be even louder microphones for um, the, the things that help make the world a better place. And when I say loud microphone, I don't necessarily mean like a 50-foot speaker with the volume up to 10. I mean uh, amplifying by uh, simply being engaged with what's happening and right. to your credit um, and as a testament to your engagement with the community uh, you have received the moss chumley award in the past and as that did you as <laughs> did i but i think it's uh it's just sort of recognizing that as beautiful as our studio experiences are and as great as it is to uh, make the kind of works that we want to make we're not in this uh, bubble and we're not by ourselves we're part of our where we we're live connected. and where we make make our work right I think the um, two things that you as you're speaking I thought of I got a text message yesterday from a friend who saw that there's a Julie Maritou painting on auction, that, and the auction is going to benefit an organization that's working to end mass incarceration. And this, the bidding, the starting bid is like 2.3 million. Yeah. And and that she's supporting this cause, you know, with this multi-million dollar painting. It's pretty, and that yeah, pretty exciting. It is. It has real life. Uh... Because it's her work, somebody will pay that. Yes. Know, and they will, there may be even like fierce bidding to contribute. Let's, to that. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's the that's sort of the the real world cause and effect of uh being a part of making something happen that's positive and making the world a better place. And that might sound like a Pollyanna lofty uh concept, but as black artists and living in a world that you know that has such a a strong 
consequence <laughs> right. just for being who you like are. You're criminalized. For, yeah. For being in your body. And something that you can't change, nor should you want to change, nor should you ever change. Um, having to live these experiences and then having an opportunity to to be a part of making the world a better place through the making our communities better places, uh, I think is, is a very powerful... Uh, place for an artist to be and so I, I applaud Aurora for creating this grant to um, acknowledge that <laughs> black artists exist and we need support but not only that that for so long the conversations in the places of power and the opportunities um, have been very few and far between for for a level playing field. Um, and so I think it's important for everyone to have skin in the game and everyone to be a part of making things better. Yeah. And when I was studying, I think, you know, I realized that the way that artists thought of culturally among, say, people of African descent and people from, say, you know, other parts of the world outside of the West um, is it's connected to everything else yeah and that there's not the, the, the separation of of art from life is artificial and so you know early as I was developing my own language and art, and art making I was responding to things that I saw in the news and those things are still the same things mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like in 19 I guess 92 it was um the Rodney, the King, Rodney thing. King thing, yeah. Yeah, so I had a really strong reaction to that. I made work about that directly. And then um, the trial with OJ. Yeah. I, you know, there's I, did, I made work directly about that. When churches were burning left and right in 1996, I made a whole big piece about that. And I think that it, for me, it's it's it comes through that kind of work and also just feeling the, not so much a responsibility, but just the need to be connected, to, yeah. to, to want to um, to be around a cultural experience that reflects me. Yeah, and it's, yeah, because it's, it's family, it's about family, and it's mm -hmm. about helping each other because we recognize that it may not be you or me today, but it could be you or me tomorrow. And uh, it's important to, you know, be there and, and be present. And it's also just really hard to <laughs> put blinders on and make art when the world around you is coming at you. And you're right, you can't just take your hat off and say, okay, today I'm not an artist, today I'm just, you know... Mm -hmm. Or today I'm an artist and nothing else. It's always interwoven. Always and it, yeah. It's also, I think of like it. part of my part of my um, inclination to be student community oriented is how you know I'm I'm just it's just reciprocating. Mm -hmm. you know, I've been taken under the wings of people, and so I take people under my wings. It's just the same, you know, yeah. just passing that on, and it's just how it just feels very natural. To do that. And I love that sort of reciprocal experience because they're two young artists, Taylor Barnes and Ari Briel, that uh, you've mentored. And they are, you know, they have practices of their own and they're they're starting out, but they're they're in a good place. And it's through no small um uh, result of just having someone that uh, looks like them that they can talk to mm. and it might it might be a superficial thing or it might be a sort of a peripheral thing but I, I think it's like when I was at TCU I had <laughs> yourself I had myself <laughs> I had to explain myself and um uh, 
I had, you know, a good working relationship with the artists there and the the professors. So how did you, what did you do? Did you find people in the community? Did you, what did you do? Oh, man, I think I just went inwards. I think I just tried to problem solve on my own, uh, internalize some of the struggles that I was having because it was like, even the thing that I, uh, that artists always struggle with, and particularly black artists. Mm -hmm. I want to make art. I really, I have been seduced by conceptualism and abstraction and uh, all these powerful forces that have like ebbed and flowed through uh, art as we know it. But this world is burning up inside me and at me. And I, I want to find a way to connect the two because I, I sort of moved from photography to um, installation. And I think that came from my, my frustration, like hitting a brick wall with photography and saying, this can't go any further. Um, I started a photography collective and I immediately quit because it, it was like, I don't believe in what I'm doing. Uh, and so, so yeah. did you then like, did you like just dig into history? Did you look at, did you try to find artists? Since there were none close to you in person, did you just dig into books and magazines and I films mean, and... There, there were glimpses of things. Uh, I was fortunate to you know, be in Fort Worth near a couple of really great museums. And some of that really helped. Uh, the Tuesday night lectures helped, you know. Uh, Absolutely. The Trenton Doyle Hancock had, you remember that retrospective at the old, not yeah. the retrospective, but like the a show. big show yeah. at the old building at the Modern. Yeah. That was a profound, like, mind blow for me. I was like, okay, <laughs> this guy's sitting here and like pouring a bucket of water over his head and like he's all over these walls and... Um, and he's created an alternate universe. Yeah, that that he's you know thought of. And uh, and Fred Wilson minding their museum mm -hmm. uh, was a really impactful um, exhibition for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so like little things like that started creeping in um, and getting to know the works of artists in this community, uh, and I slowly like sort of felt more comfortable making things and diving into the kind of work that I wanted to make. And But it wasn't until early 2000s when I when these police killings just started like cropping up and just uh, being a big part of recognizing how powerless each news program made me feel but oh. also how powerful the language of art made me feel that I started to really just sort of like dig in and uh, move in that direction. And I think it, it, it helped that I was ready to be in that place and, and start looking for solutions with other people. Mm -hmm. And finding, seeking out communities, seeking out black communities to work with and work through some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, like my ARC project in Oak Cliff with uh, the building communities workshop. Um, just getting to meet those people in the historic 10th Street uh, neighborhood in South Dallas and working on a big project together that art project was like uh just getting everybody involved um and dreaming and hoping you know that gentrification would <laughs> stay away it didn't quite work I was gonna uh, say, how did and you, you can yeah exactly <laughs> how, what did you think would happen um yeah. but it was a good experience because it it um showed me the possibility of uh, 
directly working with people and like melding my practice in a way that uh, wasn't only always about uh, making things and putting them on the wall, but about really just like combining this idea of living, breathing, being, and then uh, finding ways to uh, connect the two, the the art, the creativity, the um, desire to be a part of a community and and going from there yeah it's always it always amazes me so your experience with um like i mean you came from a great community of artists in houston and you have been a part of growing a great community of artists in dfw but like as far as like your introduction and connection with black artists how did that how did that develop so I, I was like you at TCU when I was at the Hartford Art School in Hartford, Connecticut. It was just me. And, um, yeah. and I sought out the community of other black students because it was a small university, like maybe 50 black students out of 5,000 yeah. students. But I would make sure I was you know, hanging out with them and partying with them and yeah. you know, being a part of the African American Students Association. I did all of that. Then I went to grad school at the Maryland Institute College of Art where Leslie King Hammond, a black woman, Dr. Leslie King Hammond, was the Dean of Graduate Studies. Mm -hmm. And she was making it her business to make that program a place where black students felt welcome and felt like a part of something. Yeah. So there was eight of us. There were eight black students in the graduate program there. And that was the first time I was, ex I was having the experience of being in a group, you know? Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, just the population of the students, she and Lowry Sims uh, curated an exhibition called Art as a Verb. Mm. And I was just very fortunate to be in grad school when that show was up. It was performance and installation art by black artists. Mm. So the artists were, and I might not remember every single one, but David Hammonds, Adrian Piper, Faith Ringo, Betty Saar. Wow. Um, a guy named Charles Abrams. Um, uh, Senga Nimgudi. Uh, I can't. Think, I can't remember anybody else. But these were the nice. these artists were installing. They were around. They were visiting our studios, and um, so I felt like you know. Again, I was at the like the way I felt in Houston about being like at the center of everything, being the community artist collective. Yeah. While I was at at the Maryland Institute College of Art, I was at the center of something also. So just fortunate, just lucky. You know? Man. So I had studio visits with Adrian Piper, wow. with David Hammonds, wow. with Betty Saar, you know, as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to just be... So I just felt like I was being like, you know, touched on the, the yeah. <laughs> on both shoulders, you know. And I'm sure your students at UNT have benefited from that, all your students, because mm -hmm. having a diverse group of people that artists can both uh, learn from, see themselves in, and connect with is vital to whether someone continues making art or not, or whether they feel like, uh, I was having a conversation with Sierra L. Bryant and talking about her grad school experience, and it was just acknowledging this need to have someone there someone that you can bounce ideas off, someone that can see a way into what you're you're experiencing and thinking and not just dismiss it right. and not just look at it as the experience of every other student there because it's not the same experience. Right. Right. It doesn't it doesn't mean you have to be coddled or no. treated with special care, but it does mean that you there's some you have to acknowledge that something's missing. Yeah. You can't you know there is there is something that that's missing, and to to figure out how to accommodate that thing that's missing is important. Yeah. And I think at UNT, um, Ari is the person who kind of came to me. You know, yeah. Taylor saw me and was like, "Hey, I need to talk to you," and, <laughs> yeah. and that's what I would have done if I was a student at UNT. You know, um, and so I was happy to be there. Yeah. Now Lauren's there. Lauren Cross is there. Yeah, so, such a great artist and. Yeah. Uh, she started that uh, Women of Color Artist Gallery. That was such, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it's still going, Lauren, and I know that it's, you know, out in the interwebs, but it was such a great and powerful space for Fort Worth. Lauren comes from Houston. I know. So all roads lead to Houston. <laughs> all roads lead to Houston. <laughs> I, all roads lead to Houston in black art. I, I am happy yeah. to be in this new community where uh, I'm learning so much from the artists that are there and making it happen in the black community. And um, yeah, it's it's so great. It, to, I, to be that close. I honestly didn't. I was resistant to the idea of living in Houston because I'm an East Coast person. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to go all the way to Texas to live in a city. I'm not doing that. <laughs> and then it was the best thing that ever happened. Um, Therein lies the uh, uh, lesson. Right. The prejudice of being an East Coast person. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit. I mean, well, I, I don't know. It's like Texas was not on my radar at all. Until I was at Micah, and there were people from Texas there. Yeah. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll look at that, you know. And I Everywhere also... you go, there are people from Texas That's there. True. I think Micah does a good deal of recruiting. Yeah. In Texas, but also, um, you know, beyond those th that show that I mentioned, I also studied with Robert Storr at Micah. Oh he my was God. One of the teachers. Yeah. And. Um, uh, Raymond a Sanders. giant of criticism. Right, Raymond Sanders, a painter. I think he taught a class like that I was in a seminar. So, so it's not a so, mystery that you, <laughs> you so no are as like awesome <laughs> as you are. It All comes, their from, energy kind of went comes from that energy. Yeah. 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 So again, also think this timing and good fortune is part of that. But then using it, like I moved to Texas. I knew I had um, one person's phone number in Austin. Wow. And I had applied for the the uh, Texas Commission on the Arts Artists in Residence thing, and Michelle Barnes chose me. Wow! And that started everything. You know, that's the the root of. I this, think my next years, my next know? conversation is going to be with Michelle Barnes. <laughs> uh, yes, you must talk to Michelle. Barnes. Yeah. All right. Well, what else? Um, I think I think it's. I think for, for younger artists, for black artists, and for anybody, seeking out your, you know, people who you need to um, uh, be in touch with in order to feel like, you know, you can progress with your work. Yeah. It's, it's, it's I would say, I would, I'm thinking in percentages, like probably 60% in your studio, 20% talking to people. I would say like 30% talking to people. 30 and then 10% then 10 10 thinking about just thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because that's the thing. It's uh, There's some initiative that has to come from the artist. You have to, even if you don't see any kind of um, place that, that looks like you or resonates with you, you have to... You have to, if you're going to be an artist, you have to be a part of the community of artists that exist. And in that community, you have to find the people that can uh, help you on that path to feel a sense of uh, like purpose and a, a sense of belonging. But then you also have to support the, the other artists that are in that. Because I think just right. by supporting your fellow artists, uh, you sometimes get these opportunities that seem like they fell out of nowhere, but it's because Cause you've been you're, around. You're around and you're supporting other artists. You're not like out there saying, Look at me, look at me. No. You're out there saying, I'm here to look at what you're doing. And then invariably someone says, Oh, by the way, what, what do you, you do? Doing? <laughs> and then you say, Oh, I do this thing. And then. Right. It, it it may happen from there, but from a sincere place of wanting to connect with other artists, because I think artists have a strong voice and a strong um, calling to help make the world better. I mean, I, I can't put it any other way. It's creativity is maybe a human thing one of the things that really define us as human beings and i think it's 
with that comes the the responsibility of using that superpower to <laughs> to make the world better. Right. And we're nothing but a story. It's yeah. all just a story, you know, and how you what who who's part of your story, how you're part of other people's story and how you're telling that story as a visual artist, a musician, theater person, dancer, whatever whatever form it, it's in. Yeah. Street storytelling like journalism, you know. Yeah. Well, um there's, there's really nothing else. There it is. There's nothing else but art. Aurora, <clears throat> thank you for giving us the opportunity to have a conversation about our work and about the things that we do and how we're connected to this great DFW community. And uh, keep supporting artists is what I say. Yes, do that. <laughs> Boom. <laughs>
it's absolutely transformative. Back when I was getting grants and uh, cash awards, uh, they were like a thousand and below. And so something like $5,000 is, uh, can be transformative as little as that can be uh, in sort of like the greater context of, you know, how long can you live on $5,000? But at the same time, um, it's far better than, you know, like $250 or $500 or even $1,000. So yeah, I think it's important to um, have that partnership with organizations that um, want to support the arts and want to support artists in a, a meaningful way it uh, you know it it's important to make the the availability of grants like that significant enough so that it does make a difference uh, versus going to maybe one single bill or going to uh, uh, one exhibition so I think that's that that's a really uh, a good place to start wonderful wonderful um, yeah, it looks, uh, just, uh, reaching out for some questions and see who, uh, is, is out there. I know that, uh, I did get some questions earlier today. Yeah. But, uh, we'll just give it a minute and see what comes in. But, uh, in the meantime, we'll just talk a little bit about, uh, I love you, the relationship that you share with Annette, um, you guys. You guys obviously have a history there together. Yeah, it was a beautiful, spontaneous uh, friendship that just grew out of uh, going to that shared interest of uh, lectures at the Modern. I was a lot closer. I was like uh, minutes away and she was driving from Denton. And it also introduced me to another artist, Vincent Falsetta, and we would just go, yeah, and sit at a coffee shop across the street after the shows and talk about, or after the lectures and just talk about uh, either topics that were brought up during the lecture. And they're like really frank conversations. I had very, uh, I didn't know Annette's work very well at the time, uh, nor Vincent's, and I subsequently did. And um, it was just about, life, art, um, things happening in the city. And I, I, I think it's just, uh, it grew out of that. And then there is a lot of parallel paths. I, I'm <laughs> way behind Annette, but I'm struggling to uh, uh, get to her level. But she, uh, yeah, there are things that we have both been associated with, like the the Dozier Travel Grant at the DMA and the Moss Chumley Award at SMU Meadows. Um, but we also just have a lot of um, people in the art circle that working in DFW, it's easy to be a part of. Like every, everyone goes to everything and most people know some people, <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Dallas is a big place. So is Fort Worth. But really, you know, once you get out into the art scene, if you keep talking, you know, I've always find you, you run into the same people again and again. Yeah. And even uh, across the state, you know, uh, there are four big cities in Texas and a bunch of cities around those cities. And a lot of artists just kind of move between San Antonio, Austin, DFW, Houston, and it all seems to just sort of like, uh, you cross those paths and there's something in every region that kind of um, feeds what uh, is lacking in where you are, or it adds, uh, you bring something else to, the city that you're going to that that it doesn't have so I like that connection and I like that relationship yeah well yeah. um it looks like a, a person has one question uh yeah they, they just want to know the best way to follow you 
and oh. learn more about you. Uh, so uh, every every everything you'd like to share right now that can get people to your work. ChristopherBlade.com. That's it. Uh, <laughs> I have an Instagram account as well. Uh, and it's just artist C Blay. Um, but that's, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, here we go. We have one more question. Let's see. Regarding community oriented art, are there any projects you're looking forward to in the future? And what do you see as the inspiration for this project? Uh, I'm working on a project in Fort Worth that started seven years ago. Um, it is a public art project that connects the Freedman's Town in Fort Worth with the greater civil rights movement in America. And I've transformed a transit bus into a bus stop. And I have a panel in it. By the way, this is in progress. So the hope is that it'll be <laughs> completed this year, which was the hope for the preceding six years, but we're getting very close. Um, but yeah, the, the bus stop serves as a resting place where you can um, read information about the neighborhood and about the civil rights movement, but particularly how that movement, um, how the transit system connected that movement from the Montgomery bus boycott, um, boycotts to um, the Freedom Riders to busing uh, children across neighborhoods to schools, that uh, the transit system was an integral part. So uh, the project had to be on one of the sidewalks in the neighborhood on East Rosedale Avenue, just east of I-35. And I thought, why not put a bus stop on the sidewalk? And as you stop uh, and take in the neighborhood while you're waiting for your bus or escaping the Texas heat, uh, you can learn about the neighborhood and learn about the role of the transit system. But beyond that, it's also a gathering space. Across the street from it is a little square where the neighbors have the Harambe festival each year and the streets are blocked around that area. And so the goal is for that to be a gathering space also to uh, share information about the neighborhood. And um, I've created a, a contest with students that live in the neighborhood to um, create a line of poetry for the digital sign that's going to be in the bus in the bus stop so that's one way i'm connecting with um that neighborhood that sounds fantastic T this year's the year i can this year's can... the year <laughs> knock on wood and send all the positive energy my way you got it well christopher it has been so wonderful to have you this evening thank you so much uh, thank you for having the discussion with the net. Uh, again, thank you everybody for watching and thank you to the PNC Foundation for uh, helping Aurora make all this happen. Uh, again, it's ChristopherBlay.com to stay in touch with every project and uh, his work. And um, yeah, we're, we're AuroraDallas.com and what a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Take Bye, care. Bye, everybody. Bye.